Hello and welcome to Fundamentals of Dentistry. I'm Dr. Howard Glazer and it's my pleasure to be your guest speaker for this evening's session. Uh, a little bit about myself to begin. I am a fellow and past president of the Academy of General Dentistry and the Deputy Chief Forensic Dental Consultant to the Office of Chief Medical Examiner of the City of New York. I've lectured across the country and across the globe on cosmetic dentistry, forensic dentistry, and patient management. Currently, I author a monthly column in AGD Impact Magazine entitled What's Hot and What's Getting Hotter. I also uh, maintain a private general practice in Fort Lee, New Jersey. Sponsored by Shofu, this presentation is entitled A Primer on Dental Adhesion, and I'm looking forward to sharing some great information with you. But first, let me take care of a few housekeeping items. This webinar will run approximately 45 minutes, and you can pose questions using the tool at the bottom of your screen. We will collect those and address as many as possible during the presentation, and if not, after the presentation. Okay, so without any further business to handle, let's begin. And welcome to a primer on dental adhesion. First, let me state some of the learning objectives that I have prepared for you this evening. I'd like to begin by sharing a brief history and some clinical, clinical indications for using adhesive resin uh, bonding procedures. I would like to discuss the evolution of the adhesive bonding in dentistry. And probably more importantly, we'll explain the methods of action and the indications of the total etch and self etch adhesives. And lastly, but probably more, even more important, is we'll present some practical recommendations for improving adhesion resin dentistry in the clinical setting. So let's begin. I call adhesives a very sticky subject, and I'm going to try and simplify it for you. Because today, as practitioners, we can place very aesthetic restorations with good, strong bond strengths that have an incredible resistance to micro leakage. In fact, issues of micro leakage causing sensitivity basically have been eliminated. We can safely place adhesive resin restorations and be confident that our patient has been well treated. We also are able to use these in a wide range of clinical applications in restorative dentistry. We can use them, for example, in direct composite resin restorations. We can use them in indirect resin restorations, PLV, porcelain laminate veneer restorations. Of course, with crowns, bridges, posts and cores, fiber posts, pit and fissure sealants, some endodontic obturation materials can be used with this and do require this, uh, fixed orthodontic brackets and appliances, and certainly for treating an ever prevalent problem, dental hypersensitivity, which more often than not, we are seeing a higher incidence of that, and I think in part due to the aging population that we are treating today in our offices. Um, a little bit about the history. It was Bonacore who first did propose the application of adhesives in dentistry so that we had a material that would adhere to the tooth structure and not simply lock into the tooth structure as was the case with alloy type restorations. Um, back in 1949, researcher Hager developed a material composed of uh, glycerol phosphoric acid, dimethylacrylate, dimethacrylate rather, and that was one of the first type of adhesive resins developed. Further research a few years later by Kramer and McLean suggested that adhesives would chemically bond to the tooth structure and actually physically lock onto the tooth structure. Fast forward to the 60s, which sounds like so far long ago, but it's really not that far off. We became aware of our first commercially available pit and fissure sealants and composite resins that utilized adhesive technology in the clinical experience in placing these in patients' mouths. Now, about 22 years later, it was Nakabayashi who did propose successfully a mechanism for bonding to dentin that described the infiltration of resin ionomers, resin monomers, rather, into the tooth. Now, in the 1990s, with the advent of fourth generation, we came upon the hybrid layer that was acceptable in the clinical practice, and we ended up with both multi-step and single-step adhesives that were available and rapidly advancing from there. So that's just a little background of where we are today. We take this as commonplace and very matter of fact, but there was a lot of effort and research that went into providing us with the adhesive resin strengths that we have available to us today. So let's talk about some of the prevailing adhesive systems that are available to us. 
we have resin-based adhesives, adhesives that are usually categorized as either an etch and rinse or what we commonly refer to as a total etch technique, or we have the self-etched adhesives in which there is no additional step necessary for etching the tooth prior to placement. Current efforts are focusing on simplifying the number of steps and processes. Hence, we've gone from fourth to fifth to sixth to seventh generation and actually moving in perhaps in the future to more of a universal uh, situation in an eighth generation. But right now, all of our modern systems require some etching and the mineralization of the tooth structure, depending on the chemistry of the system selected. In both the etch and rinse and self etch adhesives, you can produce an interface at the juncture so that you can get a strong bond to the tooth structure. Now, with different is an adverse to be considerate in the selection of either approach and you need to know what's available to you and how the mechanism is going to work. We have two different types. Let's talk about the total etch which is the older more established approach if you will. It's generally performed using a three-step or a two-step process. The first and foremost step is generally providing a phosphoric acid 35-37% which is used to preferentially etch the tooth surfaces prior to the application of a primer and the adhesive itself. In doing so, one removes the smear layer and opens up the dentin tubules for the application of the adhesive polymers. When we look at the self-etch approach, which is something that I personally like, number one, it doesn't require a separate etching step. So A, that's one less product that you need to buy, and it simplifies the procedure in and of itself. Instead of removing the smear layer, it actually conditions and primes the tooth that surfaces at the same time without a rinse step. So you don't have to re-wet the uh, preparation, the cavity preparation. And it partially dissolves the hydroxyapatite to produce a resin infiltrated layer with minerals incorporated into that. So how do we as GPs or practitioners consider each step? Let's look at the total etch mechanism of action. This is for both enamel and dentin bonding using a total etch approach consisting of three steps. As we talked about before, we're going to demineralize the surface with a phosphoric acid. We're going to penetrate the adhesive monomers into the microscopic spaces created by the etchant, as seen in the SEM to the right. And then we're going to cure the adhesive monomers to form resin tags that microscopically provide a mechanical bond and seal the dentin and enamel. In the enamel itself, these micro resin tags are created peripherally around the demineralized surface of the hydroxyapatite crystals. Micro tags are then formed by a resin penetration into demineralized crypts within the crystals. And you see these voids illustrated in the SEM again that appears on your screen to the right. The total mechanism of action here in a, in a total etch technique is in dentin, we create a demineralized surface about three to five microns into the dentin. So we're into that D1 layer. Upon rinsing the acid, the smear layer and other debris are removed from the surface. Failure to remove the smear layer reduces the dentin permeability, and this, that layer then acts as a barrier and prevents adhesion to the underlying intact tooth structure. So it's very important that we do remove this, the smear layer. Now, in dentin, the etchant, as we said, creates this demineralized layer. In enamel and dentin, when we come to the selective etch system, well, let's go back a slide, actually, because I want to cover another point. We talked about the three to five microns, and the failure to remove the smear layer could reduce our dentin permeability and actually cause a failure. But following the acid conditioning, the collagen contained in the den is opened and exposed. It is then that the adhesive monomers will envelop the exposed collagen and the remaining mineral, creating a penetrating lock into the dentinal structure. And this creates mineralized dentin, thus forming this hybrid layer that we talk about into the tubules and intertubular dentition. Um, we got a question from Steve McDaniel, and 
where does the selective fall in this paradigm? And I think we're going to cover that, Steve, as we move now into the selective etch mechanisms of action. So hang in, and I think we'll be able to uh, get your question answered. Uh, when we look at the selective etch, or the self-etch, rather, mechanism of action in both enamel and dentin, first and most important thing is it doesn't require an etch and rinse step. So we've eliminated a time-consuming and cost to buy the etch and then spend time rinsing. Our demineralization process occurs at the same time that we have the penetration of the adhesive, thus preventing a collapse of the collagen fibrils after conditioning and drying. So by incorporating it into one step, we don't have to worry about collapse of our collagen fibrils, and we can actually keep them open and ready to go. In both the enamel and the dentin, the mechanism of action is believed to be a combination of both mechanical and chemical reaction. Again, we're producing a hybrid layer similar to what we did in the total etch technique without the, the possibility of over etching. Over etching is what potentially could cause sensitivity. The material does contain water, so it will actually facilitate the acid reaction to the tooth surface. So what are the clinical advantages when we look at a self-etch adhesive technique? Number one, no over etching. That potentially could induce sensitivity. No over drying or desiccation of the tooth. By drying it, we're not going to get our bond. We need a wetter surface to allow our adhesive resin to actually attach to the tooth structure. And when in doing so, we actually can create a hybrid layer that has no differentiation between the depth of the etch or this hybrid layer, and it actually forms a very concise and consistent layer upon which we will ultimately place our bonding, our resin materials. Now, all of you hear um, about fourth generation, fifth generation, sixth and seventh. I typically pick up at the fourth generation because that's really when we started to achieve bond strengths over 18 megapascals, uh, Bonacor and Fusiyama in Japan uh, were very critical that we needed to maintain a minimum of about 18 megapascals of bond strength in the enamel in order to have a good strong adhesive bond. So we develop a sense of lines drawn in the sand to differentiate whether we're talking about one bottle or two bottle, etch step, no separate etch step. So with this little grid, I want to see if I can explain things to you so that you understand where each of the generation falls. So if we have a more than one bottle system, two or three bottle system, and it requires a separate etch step, we're talking about the fourth generation of materials. If we have a separate etch step, but we now have only one bottle to deal with, we're talking about the fifth generation. And as we move up in generations, our bond strengths kept getting stronger. Sensitivity was no longer an issue, but we were still looking for something easier and better. So we felt that if we could eliminate the separate etch step, but perhaps still had a deal with a primer and an adhesive with a two-bottle system, we were now talking about the sixth generation. Well, time has changed, and in order to make things faster and easier and better, not only for me, the doctor, and you, the doctor, but ultimately the end user is the patient, so it's got to be faster, easier, and better for the patient. We've come to the single component, one bottle, no separate etch step, and that brings us to the seventh generation. Now, in the next slide here, let's look, about, look at the fourth generation again. And maybe without a grid, it'll make a little bit more sense. In a three-step fourth generation total etch procedure, you had to first apply the etchant, then a primer, and then your adhesive. We shortened that in the fifth generation to just simply applying an etchant material. And then we had a bottle that contained our combined primer and adhesive. When we moved to the sixth generation, we again still had an acidic primer that was built into our system, and then we had a separate bottle for the adhesive. Now, as we move into the ever popular and fast moving popular, increasing popularity of the seventh generation materials, we are combining our acidic primer with the adhesive in one bottle, single application systems that make it so much better for you and I as the practitioner, but ultimately it's better for the patient as well. So let's look at these seventh generation materials. And one in particular that we're going to talk about 
is one that is manufactured by Shofu and its beauty bond. But the characteristics in general are the same for all seventh generation adhesives. It is a one step self etch bonding agent. They are available as a HEMA free formulation, which therefore in and of itself by eliminating the HEMA is going to improve the bond strengths. And you still can use an etch. I think that's important to know. You can still use a selective etch technique, and I on occasion will do, in fact, I did one this afternoon like that, where a patient fractured off an entire lingual cusp, and I was using a seventh generation beauty bond, my seventh generation, but I did etch the perimeter beveled enamel surfaces because so much tooth structure was lost, I felt it was like a belt and suspender technique. So this was an easy way to ensure a successful result, and the overall application of my adhesive resin procedure is 30 seconds from application to finish. So it's not like we're taking up an inordinate amount of time. Beauty Bond, as I mentioned, is a seventh generation adhesive with the bond strengths of, of sixth generation. So we're in our mid to upper 20s in terms of bond strength. And that's significant. What makes Beauty Bond so different from others is its unique dual monomer system. It has a phosphonic acid monomer, which increases its bond strength to enamel, and a carboxylic acid monomer system that increases the bonding to dentin. So with this dual monomer system, you get increased strength in both the enamel and the dentin, yielding a very high bond strength and yet a very low, micro, a very low hybrid layer. In fact, it's only five microns and it's the lowest available in the market today. You're looking at a low five micron film thickness, which is incredible. And the bond strengths, as I said, are in the mid to upper ranges for both enamel and dentin. And this was proven in, and published in the Journal of Applied Oral Sciences uh, by Sabatini back in 2013. So the research is there to substantiate uh, the claims that Shofu is making. And in clinical practice, we see this on a daily basis that it is strong. Um, Beauty Bond has a self etched self-adhesive monomer in it, as we just talked about, a dual monomers. It's actually available, as you see in the picture to the right, in either a unit dose of 0.1 milliliters or a 6 milliliter bottle. Now, let me tell you, I'm not a big fan of the bottle. Why? It's got a solvent. If you don't cap the bottle right away, your solvent is going to evaporate, and then you have a lot of non-usable adhesive resin material in that bottle. So I prefer that I use the unit dose routinely. First of all, take a look at the design. It's a very flat based design. So laying on your bracket table or on your tray, I call it Weebles wobble, it won't fall down. It's very hard to tip that over. So if it's containing 0.1 milliliters, what does that translate to in clinical practice? You can actually apply it to about three teeth prepared already and if you do the resin step at the same time for all three teeth, let's hypothetically say you have a molar and two bicuspids. You would isolate them, whether it's on the rubber dam preferably, or with cotton roll isolation in a dry field, and you will now apply it to the molar and the two bicuspids and photo cure it one after the other so that you're doing the adhesive resin step for all three simultaneously. You can't do it for the molar, fill it, then go back because your material will evaporate out of the unit dose just as easily. So keep in mind that if you're doing three teeth in a row and you're doing quadrant dentistry or hemispheric dentistry, you only have to open one unit dose. It's not like you're wasting it one per tooth. This is a very simple application too. You apply it once, you air dry, and then you photo cure. Total time start to finish, 30 seconds, and you're fully polymerized. There's no gingival blanching. It's a hemer free. Let me talk to you about the air. When we did the fourth, fifth, and sixth generations, we were a little different in our air drying approach. We did a quick blast of our air with our three-way syringe of, of air, and we were done. With seventh generation, what I and others have found is that we need a stream of air three to 10 seconds, five to 10 seconds, starting outside the preparation, if you will, I don't know if I can demonstrate this with my hands, but in any event, in your mind, visualize starting outside the preparation and 
gently bringing your airstream into the preparation till you see a dissipation of all fluid movement. At that time, you photo cure it, and then you're done. So very easy to apply. Instructions are very good. Pictorial instructions, uh, they're very, very good there. Now, let me cover a couple of common questions that I get relative to seventh generation. It was very interesting. When seventh generation first came about, and I and Carl Leinfelder were the two who first introduced a good seventh generation called Ibon by Horaeus uh, many, many years ago, the naysayers all said, oh my God, you can't etch, I'm sorry, you can't use a seventh generation on uncut enamel. Well, they're absolutely correct, you can't. But if you're doing adhesive resin dentistry correctly, as I see it, you should be beveling the enamel because when you bevel the enamel, you're going to be able to get greater bond strength to the enamel, and you're going to be able to hide your margins and create invisible margins for your restorations. So in answer to the question, should I etch? You can etch if you want, but it's not necessary. Etching will improve the bond strength to the enamel only, to the only to the enamel. And the question is, can you use a seventh generation on uncut enamel? You cannot, but if you're doing adhesive resin dentistry correctly, you're beveling the enamel, what did you just do? You cut the enamel. Now, be very careful. If you do this selective etch procedure, make sure you keep it off the dentin. If you have it on the dentin, you'll actually decrease the bond strength and possibly increase the potential for microleakage and post-op sensitivity. Another frequently asked question. In the early days, and I pretty much have answered this, but why in the early days did we see marginal stain around teeth that we use the seventh generation? And I in, in myself have seen that on restorations I did, you know, many, many, many years ago. Mostly it's it's because at that point I was learning at the time we were doing adhesive resin dentistry, we were butt jointing our resins to the enamel. As I just said, in order for this to be most effective, you bevel your restoration, creating invisible margins and extending your bond to get the greater bond strength to the enamel itself. So therefore it's imperative to create this bevel and finish and polish to that bevel, leaving no flash or uncut enamel, that's what stains. So we're gonna have nice long bevels. I always like the example, if you can think of a calla lily flower with the petals that flare out um, it's very nice to keep that in your mind because you want your bevels and marginal extension to be very great for increased bond strength. So what characteristics then uh, are beneficial for the future of adhesive bonding? Let's took a, take a look at that. Number one, we want things that are simple. Fast application. I don't like having multiple bottles. I don't want to have a separate etch step, separate primer step. I like to do things that are faster, easier, and better, as I said both for me and for the patient. Uh, I like a material that has broad indications. I don't want to have to take out a wheel or a, or a chart and say, hey, I'm doing this procedure, which bonding agent do I need to use? I like a broad indication for my bonding material, such as the seventh generation Beauty Bond by Shofu, which has very easy, very easy to use, and it can be used in all dental procedures, and all dental substrates are acceptable of this material. You can apply it with or without the phosphoric acid selectively or in a total etch or without it in a self-etch, which is using it straight out of the bottle. Again, bear in mind, though, that if you're going to use it with selective etching, I would absolutely remind you that you must keep it on the enamel only, not on the dentin. Uh, we want lower pH values and low film thickness, less than 10 microns. Beauty Bond is the lowest in the marketplace at five microns. Uh, strength, look at the adhesion. Again, if you go back and look at the research by uh, uh, Fusiyama and Bonacore, after 18 megapascals, uh, it almost didn't matter how much more it is, but you're getting stronger and better adhesion to the hard enamel substrate with using the seventh generation. So this is a very good material to ensure good proper bonding. Now, in terms of effectiveness, the surface wetting capabilities, lower surface tension means that you're going to get a better bond to your tooth. When you put your resin materials in, you're going to get a much better bond of the material to the resin material. 
the radio opacity has to be there because that will undoubtedly help in the diagnosis as you do this. And uh, the convenience of having a bottle or a single unit to me is excellent. I like products that don't require refrigeration. Um, it's just one less thing to put into the refrigerator. Too many of our products require refrigeration. Uh, so having the availability of a non-refrigerated product is excellent. I also like the fact that I have unit dosing. In my practice, if it's made disposable or single unit, I buy it. I like to keep things very quick, easy, and simple because dentistry is tough enough. We don't want to worry about all these other extraneous things. Let's look at now at some of the clinical indications where we're going to use a universal adhesive for all direct restorations. Um, we're going to bond composite resin to self-cured, light-cured glass ionomer cement in the sandwich technique. Um, many of you might still be employing a sandwich technique, and that is perfectly fine to do. Um, we can use bonding between the layers of composite resin in large restorations to reduce polymerization shrinkage stress. Although one of the ways that I've been successfully able to uh, eliminate some of that shrinkage uh, stress is that after I've done my adhesive, ray, adhesive resin layer, I have then put in a layer of flowable resin and photocured it, maybe a half to a millimeter, or frankly, you can use regular composite for a half a millimeter to a millimeter, photocure it, and that will reduce a lot of the polymerization shrinkage stress that has traditionally been associated with composite resin materials. Having said that, one of the reasons I use Beautiful 2 by Shofu is it's got probably some of one of the lowest uh, shrinkage stress uh, factors in the marketplace today. Um, you can use this in a non-prepared area, in the cervical, for example, for sealing hypersensitive areas. And as I mentioned before, with our population maturing, there are many instances where we're getting patients coming in with hypersensitivity and therefore we need something to treat that. You have two choices. I typically will just apply it right out of the bottle. You can take a carbide burr or a diamond and roughen up the area to open up the tubules a little bit if you want, a little bit more than the material itself will do. Uh, and then you can apply it and photo cure it. 30 second application, almost instant gratification for the patient, instant relief from any sensitivity. How do you find that out? You give them water to rinse, cold water, and they're not going to shirk from it. So that's pretty good. Now, you can actually use your adhesive resin if you're doing alloy dentistry. And I have nothing to say against alloy dentistry. 37, 8, 38 years ago, I made an elective decision to just do resin dentistry. But I still have alloy in my mouth. I think it's still a very valid restoration. And you can use this as a liner, if you will, under your alloy fillings. Now, with the advent of more and more bulk fill composites from Shofu, from Ivoclar, from every company under the sun, Horaeus, GC, we're coming out with more and more bulk fills, four, five, six millimeters. This is a perfect material with low shrinkage stress to apply as your adhesive resin in that axial gingival box. Feel confident in doing so that you will get a good seal, no micro leakage, no post-operative sensitivity, and a fast, easy application of only 30 seconds. So let's continue on with the issue about post-operative sensitivity. First of all, we very often see post-operative sensitivity in all classifications from one through five. Typically, the etiology has been traced to several factors that include bacteria that might have penetrated into the pulp. Uh, sometimes your occlusal discrepancy is there. You know, I work with my patients pretty much laying, laying fat in a supine uh, position. But when I check occlusion after providing a restoration, I check it twice. Once when they're in their supine position, and second, I check it after they've rinsed and they're sitting up in an upright position, because most of us don't chew laying down. So it's much easier to pick up those occlusal discrepancies if you sit your patient up and check for the occlusion last before you dismiss them. And also sometimes there's actual deformation of the cusp as a byproduct of the polymerization shrinkage stress. And that's why I choose materials that have very, very low shrinkage stress. So that's important that we know what's causing the postoperative sensitivity and as we move now, how we're going to limit that. Number one, 
We want to leave our enamel margins roughened or beveled, as I've mentioned several times now, to enhance your bond strength. This also improves the stress distribution upon placement of our restorative materials. There is a micro-mechanical adhesive approach by designing your cavities featuring rounded internal line angles. When I ask my audiences very often what their favorite burr is, then they say it's a 558. I know that they're pretty much doing a lot of alloy dentistry and trained on alloy dentistry because a 558, for example, will leave very sharp line angles. Well, when it comes to micro and minimally invasive dentistry that we're doing with adhesive resin dental procedures, we need rounded line angles. It's the bond that's going to hold our filling in place. It's not going to be mechanical retention. Yes, some mechanical retention with the tags that we talked about before, the micro tags that are created in the dentin layer. However, with a great bulk of this is going to be retained by our dentin and enamel bonding. So if you're a 558 user or a 557 user, switch to a 1557 or a 1558. That one at the end means that it's round-ended, so it, there are no line angles. Because now, truly, in adhesive resin dentistry, you drill out the decay, bevel your margins, and you're good to go with restoration. Moisture is the, the devil of all adhesive resin uh, restorations. If you're trapping saliva, if you're getting undue moisture in your restoration, you're doomed to fail. So it's incredibly important that you isolate using rubber dam or providing proper moisture control in some other fashion, cotton rolls, the isolate, isolate system. Um, you want to make sure that you're keeping your field as dry as possible so that you're preventing any moisture, any bacterial or salivary contamination, and you're reducing airborne debris, certainly under rubber dam. That's a big factor. That's a big factor. Um, also, you want to confine your tooth reduction to the elimination of caries. We don't need these, you know, these huge monster holes in our teeth anymore. As I said, we take a round-ended cross-cut burr and we simply go in and we eliminate the decay. And in eliminating the decay, I very often, to double check myself, will use a caries indicator die to make sure that I have accurately and adequately removed all the caries. Remember, getting all the brown out very often will cause you to remove affected dentin, not decayed dentin. That dentin is stained because of the bacterial release of the porphyrins from the bacteria. That's what stains it. So it's imperative that you use caries indicator dye to make sure that you are eliminating just the decay in the preparation and not taking away healthy affected dentin, and leaving that discolored dentin has actually been shown in the research to stimulate secondary dentin growth. So it's important that we understand what we are removing and what we're leaving. So you need also then to create your cavity preparation to withstand the demands of the oral environment. That means don't forget you're subjecting this restoration to huge amounts of force, 32,000 pounds per square inch in a masticatory force is incredibly hard. So by spreading out over the bevel your margins, there's less chance of cracking at and breakdown at the interface between the enamel and the restoration. It's imperative that you use surgical loops or some sort of magnification, preferably with light. And again, I keep repeating the point, but it's so important that you bevel the margins if for no other, for no other reason at all. And I hopefully I've given you several good reasons, but if no other reason, you're going to get the most aesthetic restoration because you're going to create invisible margins as you do this. So how are we going to get a restoration such as you see on the right that looks quite natural and quite beautiful? We're going to prepare our cavity. We're going to extend, clean out, make sure there's no decay, use caries indicator dye, make sure we've got a healthy sound tooth amount of tooth structure left. We're going to then take our burr and we're going to bevel our margins so that we get increased enamel retention, good, better bond strength. If we're not sure or if we don't have sufficient tooth structure left, then perhaps you want to do a little selective etching, making sure to keep it off the dentin. We're going to do all of this under rubber dam isolation. We're going to manage the pulp as necessary. You know, if you have a thin layer 
of uh, pulpal floor and you see a little pink, you can provide your adhesive resin layer and then I'd put a little flowable over that, such as Beautiful Flow Plus. Uh, part of the reason I like the Shofu products, both the Beauty Bond and the Beautiful Flow Plus and their Restorative Beautiful 2, is they have this gyomer chemistry. The gyomer chemistry actually causes a release of fluoride, just like glass ionomer. But however, this glass ionomer, I'm sorry, this fluoride release actually is reinforced and recharges every time the patient rinses with a fluoride rinse, brushes with a fluoride toothpaste, or drinks fluoridated water. Unlike glass ionomer, where the fluoride release dissipates over 30 to 60 days. So again, rubber dam isolation, prepare our cavity, manage the pulp. Now we're going to apply our, our adhesive. We're going to take our brush, open our unit dose, apply our adhesive into the deepest portion of the cavity, starting at the occlusal end of the preparation, so that like when you're washing your car, the excess drips into the cavity prep, washing it around the walls and the floor. And my philosophy is if it has a fuzzy brush at the end, you rub and scrub as you put your material in. We're going to allow it to set properly. We're going to dry it, air dry. Remember I said three to 10 seconds coming into the preparation, gently blowing our, our dry air. When we see the dissipation of all fluid movement, we're going to photo cure it and we are done with our adhesive resin. Now we're going to apply our uh, restorative material. We're going to place it in incremental layers. We're going to photo cure it. We're going to draw it out over our beveled margins so we have invisible margins. We're going to photo cure and then we're going to finish and we're going to polish. And typically I polish using the Shofu Super Snap system. It makes it so nice and easy or the one gloss system that they have which makes it even easier. They have cups, discs, and points that make it very easy for you to accomplish and achieve a nice high glossy sheen as you see on the picture to your right. So in this brief time that has elapsed, the last 40 minutes or so, um, we are ready to take some questions and we'll move to the questions and answers. Um, and we can uh, feed them through uh, the queue here and I'm gonna scroll through. I think we've uh, discussed the question we had about selective falling into the paradigm that we have here. And um, how much, how, and the question I have next is how much can a self edge adhesive do to cover up for a less than a perfect prep? Well, first I'd ask you, why do you have a less than a perfect prep? Uh, the object here is to have a, an adequate preparation that will hold on to the restorative material. So in the example that I tried to give before where I lost the entire lingual cusp on a bicuspid and I had basically an MODL preparation. Maybe that's what you're talking about, an MODL preparation. What I put on that tooth after I beveled my margins and isolated it, I was able to apply my beauty bond adhesive. But before I did that, I selectively etched with phosphoric acid my beveled margins. So again, why? I didn't feel I had enough retention based on tooth structure alone. It's different than the picture we showed earlier, and I'll go back uh, in the picture if I, if I can go back in the deck here. Um, it's different than when you have this picture as you see here, where you've got a confined amount of tooth structure and uh, ample amount. I'm talking about when you've lost a significant amount of tooth structure, then it becomes imperative that I think that you use a selective etch technique just etching the enamel. So I hope that answers uh, your question, Dan, and I thank you for taking the time to ask the question. Next question I have is uh, adhesives uh, do not help protect the pulp from thermal perspective, right? Will I uh, comment? You know, I'm not quite sure that that's true. In my mind, when I'm putting that layer down there, you are protecting the tooth from micro leakage. And the thermal, the thermal perspective I think you're alluding to is thermal change that might be felt by a pulp if there is inadequate coverage of that pulpal floor and you're getting micro leakage. So I think if I've adequately applied my uh, adhesive resin across the axial gingival box, across the pulpal floor entirely, 
then I don't think that it's going to be a question in my mind of thermal sensitivity. So I hope, uh, Dr. Kalia, that's uh, helped you with that question. Uh, next, do I manage deep carries differently from a standpoint of adhesive selection? Um, the answer to that is actually, uh, I think I've answered that because I, when I have a deep caries, it's to me the same as when I don't have adequate tooth structure. So my adhesive selection would still be seventh generation. However, I would make sure that I did get some additional retention by either creating some undercuts or by using um, a selective etch on the beveled enamel to adequately retain my restoration. But my adhesive choice would still be the same. Um, you know, there's an old adage that in a class five restoration, often uh, the instructor would, I remember my instructor saying, what is the all time best adhesive for a class five restoration? And the answer simply is a 35 inverted cone burr. Why? Because I trained in the days of gold foil and we used to undercut that little class five smiley face in the corners in order to get adequate retention. I don't think that's necessary with today's seventh generation like Beauty Bond. If you're unsure, it takes nothing to take an inverted cone, cone burr, half round burr, and go in and adequately uh, create some additional retention. So hopefully we have uh, addressed that. And I thank you, Erica, for that question. Um, Erica is also asking a question about the uh, shrinkage stress if I'm getting this correctly, and what's my best tip in handling shrinkage stresses? Well, number one, a product like Beauty Bond that does not have a high level of shrinkage stress, number one. Number two, using a composite resin over it, such as Beautyful 2 or Beautiful Flow or Beautiful Flow Plus, that have incredibly low shrinkage stresses. That said, if you're worried about that, using other materials, my suggestion would be that you lay down your adhesive resin layer first. After that has been photo cured, I would lay a small amount of either direct composite resin or flowable resin and only layer it in half millimeter increments building up to a total of one and a half to two, photo curing at each incremental layer and only uh, then applying the rest of my composite resin after I've layered up to the two millimeter mark. And uh, there's no harm in using a perio probe to make sure that you've achieved uh, that level of uh, buildup. Okay, what are my thoughts on amalgam bond? Um, you know, it's, I, I don't think I can comment on that because I don't use it and I don't do alloy restorations. So I apologize, but I'm gonna have to defer on that one since I don't uh, know enough about the material to comment on it. Uh, I have another question from our colleague in Louisville. Uh, what if a patient comes back with sensitivity? Even if I did selective etching, how would I approach? I'd call in sick that day. No, kidding, all kidding aside. Um, if a patient comes back with sensitivity, the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to examine with loops to make sure my margins are intact. I'm going to double check the occlusion and make sure I'd have no prematurity because more often than not, I have found that if I'm getting sensitivity, the patient's report to you is that the sensitivity is not so much due to hot. It's possibly due to some cold, but they feel it predominantly when they're biting down. And that's pretty much a dead giveaway on the occlusion. The reason we very often see that postoperatively in days or weeks later when they come back, don't forget our patients have been anesthetized. And so when we ask them to bite down on articulating paper and we're looking for the mark of the rub, they may think they are biting adequately where in fact they're not biting adequately. So again, check it with the patient sitting upright before they leave the operatory. If they come back to you, you know, and one of the key phrases, by the way, when they're tapping on that paper and then I take the paper out, when I ask them to bite down hard, do they feel the opposite side? Does it feel normal on the opposite side that's not been anesthetized? 
So that's one thing to do. If they come back with the sensitivity, we check the occlusion. If we have a prematurity and we adjust it, they almost will tell you that they feel little or no difference, which is to be expected, because think about it. If you took your index finger and you started poking somebody on their shoulder, in the immediate time frame, it would feel nothing than the poke. You did that for 24 or 48 hours, it would feel like a needle is penetrating their arm. So you've traumatized this tooth. You've stretched the periodontal ligament fibers. Let the tooth heal. I would advise them after you've made the adjustment on a soft diet, and then I would recheck it if they need be. I'd ask them to call me in 48 hours, and if there's no change, is it possible that we have A, a pulp that's dying, or B, that we have to repeat the restoration? Those are all possibilities. That, I would think, my friend, would be in the very smallest level of percentages if you follow those other steps. Hopefully that's helped you uh, with that question. So uh, as time has crept up on us at the 45-minute mark, if there are any other questions, I'd be happy to address them. Um, if we don't see any more questions, then um, I think we can begin to wrap up. Let me, let me just cover a couple of things before I do close. Uh, I try to incorporate a lot of science in a very simple way tonight. And I've tried to incorporate a little bit of practical dentistry. In the 40 years of practicing clinical dentistry uh, in private practice, I've come along with a lot of materials and I've dealt with a lot of situations that a lot of you just entering your career are going to be faced with. Don't panic, that's the first thing. You have the skills, you have the knowledge. I think you know what has to be done. Think about the things we've talked about tonight. Making sure we have a clear, clean cavity that's void of any remnant decay. Don't be afraid to use caries indicator dye. Make sure that you use it repeatedly till you're left with no indication of caries. It's okay to leave that stained dentin. You don't have to take it all out. That's affected dentin. It helps stimulate the secondary dentin growth. Make sure that you've extended your bevels onto the enamel so that you increase your bond strength and at the same time are able to create beautiful restorations. And choose your products wisely, as I have. One of the reasons I was happy to do this for Shofu tonight is because I value the time and effort they have put in to research and development. And I value the products that they bring to me to enable to treat my patients not only faster, not only easier, but provide better treatment for them. So in closing then, I wanna thank you very much for your attention this evening. I'm going to put up on the screen my email address. Many of you might have questions tomorrow, the next day, six months from now. Be happy to address them with you. I ask two favors, if you would, in the subject line. Please put that I heard you on the webinar. And in the text of your um, message to me, please put down your phone number. More often than not, I'll call you because I can speak faster than I can type. So I think we could develop a dialogue that way and perhaps help you uh, even better. So I want to, in closing, thank you very much for your attention tonight. And I th want to thank Shofu for providing this opportunity to me and to you to learn a little bit more about the fundamentals of operative dentistry. It's been my pleasure, and I hope you've enjoyed this evening. Please join us again for the next pres presentation on the Fundamentals of Opera Dentistry series. Uh, at the end of this presentation, we're going to close with a quick survey where you will be able to provide your uh, feedback before you leave the session. So I thank you very, very much, and I will um, close and wish you a very, very pleasant evening. Bye.